Pete DiGeronimo. I'm uh, an associate veterinarian at the Philadelphia Zoo. Uh, I've been here for about two years and have lived several lives prior to that. Um, and then Dominique Keller is... Dominique, what are you exactly? <laughs> what am I? Um, so I am currently the chief vet at Los Angeles Zoo. Uh, I've been here three years. I'm also the um, AZA SSP two-toed sloth vet advisor, which someone decided I was okay to be, and I'm really honored to be that position. Um, and I've worked in the field with uh, two and three-fingered sloths, so um, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but I do love them. So it's part of the reason I'm here today. Fantastic. I had the um, the honor the dubious distinction of um, having a, a fatal case of GDV and a sloth and then got to co-author a paper and that uh, won me the <laughs> distinction to uh, speak to you today, which is definitely an honor. So the outline, we'll talk a little bit about the taxonomy and then um, the clinical relevance of the taxonomy, husbandry, and talk a little bit about chemical restraint and then get into anatomy and your physical examination of sloth patients. And then we'll talk a little bit about preventative care. So I think we're all familiar, um, and if we're not, we'll go through it briefly. So in the xenarthrins, um, there's really two main flavors, the pilosa, which are the, the hairy ones, as the name suggests, and then the chingulata, the armadillos. And so when we look at sloths in the folivora, they're the, the leaf eaters. Um, the point of, of this clinically is that when we're working with sloths or with any animal um, for which a lot of information or medical information might not be known, we rely heavily on comparative anatomy and physiology and comparative taxonomy. And so for sloths, depending on our clinical question or interest, we might be comparing them to um, what is known about other foregut fermenters, because they're foregut fermenters, or we might look at the most closely um, related species or taxa um, uh, taxonomically, and that would help us to, to basically practice medicine, make comparisons um, between species. And so of the Folivora, they're all New World animals, and they're all arboreal. So um, everything about the sloth is really adapted for living life almost 100% in trees. Of the extant varieties of sloth, we have two main flavors. So our two-toed sloths, and the three toads, the Bradypodidae. So we're just going to touch briefly on the, the three toads. Um, you can see that they come in basically five flavors. Um, in the map, you have a distribution of the main sloth, pale-throated, and the brown-throated sloths. These are considered um, diurnal and are strict folivores. And for that reason, they're rarely kept in captivity because their diet is so very specialized that it makes it very difficult in order to, um, to feed them adequately. If uh, there are two species that fall um, under IUCN listings of uh, threatened categories, so the um, main sloth, which is vulnerable, and the pygmy sloth, which is listed as critically endangered. For more information about their, their captive health and husbandry, there's a great paper in zoo biology from 2005 to refer to. But for our purposes here, for the most part, we're going to be talking about the megalonicidae, so the two-toed sloths, which are more commonly kept in captivity. So they come in two main flavors, um, Hoffman's, and uh, Linnaeus is also called Linnaeus uh, two-toed sloth. These are considered, um, most of the literature is gonna say that they're nocturnal, but there's some information that they might be cathemeral, meaning that they're not necessarily strictly diurnal or nocturnal. I think um, part of it, a good point to, to take home is that many of our animals adapt well to um, life cycles, uh, light cycles in captivity they might um, cluster their activity during the day or during the night. It's one reason um, why to, we should provide them with enrichment overnight or foraging opportunities overnight, because they might be more active um, when the lights are out. And if they're being kept in a zoo, for example, when um, the, the guests and the staff are not present. 
And then these guys are um, functional folivores. So really the majority of their diet is, uh, is leaves, but they can be omnivorous. A lot of the literature will say that they'll feed on small vertebrate prey, they'll um, forage on um, insects and uh, bird eggs or animal eggs if they find them. And they'll also consume uh, fruit and other vegetable matter. Uh, and these are the species that are commonly kept in captivity. So for their environment, um, being New World's tropical species, they are adapted to a warm, uh, warm climate and a relatively high ambient humidity. The recommendation currently is that if the temperature drops um, to 15 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, that supplemental heat needs to be provided. There is um, a consideration for whether we provide them with natural sunlight or other lighting and how we provide um, the light cycle. So if we think that they're nocturnal, should we have them on an opposite light cycle when they're in captivity so that they'll be more active when there's guests for viewing. Um, I don't know of too many institutions that, that do that. Do you, Dominique? No, um, I think I've only worked at one that did. Um, and those sloths, when we moved them out from the reverse light cycle, actually did better um, on our, our current cycle. And that was very interesting, actually. Mm. Generally, we keep them in like relatively large spaces. Um, not just with like a, a square foot footprint, but also um, vertical space for climbing and enough of structures um, to accommodate that. They need platforms or baskets, make good spots um, for resting, and then visual barriers so that if they don't want to be in public view, um, that they can choose not to be seen or they could uh, choose to move away from, from being on display. Uh, a lot of times soil substrate is recommended. It's uh, what I've read in certain places is that they prefer the soil so that if there's an accidental fall, there's something to, to break the fall. I think the other benefit of a soil substrate is also maintaining humidity, that it helps uh, to really capture the moisture there. And then Dominique actually found this and we were both surprised to know that the USDA actually has um, a handout on a for sloth husbandry and some recommendations for how they should be kept. So for behavioral enrichment, um, it's important to provide foraging opportunities. Um, most of these can be by um, hanging different, uh, hanging their food items in different parts of the enclosure and encourages them to move around and also um, encourages natural behavior like you see in the, the picture there. It's one good way when trying to provide food overnight. Dominique and I were actually talking about this just before the, the talk, that it's very hard sometimes to, to meet the needs of the animal because if you expect them to be active overnight, well, then you should be providing them with some opportunity to exhibit normal behaviors. Um, but a lot of institutions might want to pull food from overnight because of um, our cute varmint here, like this little mouse, we have uh, mice or rats that might um, might infect certain buildings, like in an institution. And so you remove the food to prevent the the um, for as a part of pest control. And so one way of getting around that is by using hanging feeders, um, which encourages natural behavior for the sloth, and it also excludes um, access to the to the pests. So for social enrichment. Um, Sloths are solitary animals with the exception of uh, the dam with their offspring. They have been kept in mixed species enclosures, um, mostly with uh, New World primates is a very common way to, to house sloths. And then for environmental enrichment, making sure that there are plenty of, of climbing structures. And some places also offer water features. Um, I've seen a lot of really great pictures of sloths that seem to like to go into barrels or buckets of water because in the wild they also spend some time swimming um and so that's i haven't worked in a place that has offered that to a sloth i don't know if you have dominique no i haven't but it's a great way to increase the humidity sort of in a natural looking way and then gives an opportunity for the sloths to just you know have a little bit more ambient humidity which they seem to need um, So the diet, I, I would say that the diet is probably um, the keystone to preventative care and maybe one of the most important parts of, um, of sloth husbandry. 
for the the bradypus species so the the three-toed sloths like we said they're strictly folivorous um they require a constant source of fresh browse cecropia species is the maybe the most common but not not the only species that they'll eat um oftentimes in the wild they'll spend a lot of time um, foraging from a single tree or a single grove of trees before moving on. And it's considered perhaps um, one way that they get variety in their diet or to meet their nutritional needs is to rotate the species that they, they forage on. So why do we care? We care in captivity because you might have one of these animals that consistently eats a certain type of browse and then one day decides to stop and switches preference to a different type of browse. Um, and that's a could be a natural behavior, a natural adaptation to meeting their nutritional needs. And so that could be very difficult to do in captivity when you're trying to anticipate the, the food consumption of the animal, especially if you're trying to house them outside of range countries where the climate might not be hospitable to the types of, um, the types of plants that they naturally forage on. Um, so it's one of the many limitations to keeping them in, um, in captivity. For the uh, two-toed sloths, in addition to fresh browse, um, their diets are often supplemented with a formulated leaf eater biscuit. That's a general um, type of kibble that's made for um, leaf eating animals. In addition to fresh produce, both leafy greens and in moderation, some uh, root vegetable. And then things like hard boiled egg or um, or pieces of fruit that are used in moderation, um, usually for training or for treats. The Nutritional Advisory Group has come out with a document. Um, Dr. Heidi Bissell has uh, basically created a guide for feeding um, two-toed slots in captivity. And if you haven't seen it, it's a definitely a, probably one of the more valuable resources um, when trying to figure out how to adequately meet the nutritional needs of these species in captivity. Hey Pete, can I add a few things here? Please. So some thoughts here when we talk about diet and you know, neither Pete nor I are, are obviously nutritionists. So if you have a nutritionist available to you, like I did when I worked with Heidi, it's magical. They're really great at working with you and can help formulate any issues. Um, the, the things I've seen with brows, I mean, I'm not even talking about bradypus, but let's talk about the two-fingered sloths. Um, what can be a problem with zoos or institutions in, in, of managed care that are working in areas where they have winters is that their browse availability can be very limited. Now you can have it shipped into you, but that's expensive. So somewhat luckily for us, the, you know, the two fingered sloths are a little bit more omnivorous and a little bit less, um, you know, dependent on browse per se, but we do encourage people to offer browse as much as they can, but it can be a challenge, especially for Northern zoos and in our, uh, in our continent to provide that fresh browse on a daily basis, and especially the variety that I think these animals eat because we're pretty sure in the wild, they're, they're being very selective and they're eating a lot of the new growth because um, it's slightly more digestible. And that's, that's, I think one of the biggest challenges is nutrition as Pete mentioned. And then when it comes to those leaf eater biscuits, I mean, and if you do access the nutrition guide that Heidi's put together, you'll see the caveat with those is that often the ones that are available are the ones for primates, which have a lot of vitamin D because uh, as primates we're you know, D dependent. So that can be tricky for sloths as we'll cover later. Um, what hasn't been explored a lot when it comes to eating biscuits is can we offer them something that's for another type of folivore, so like a browser that's a ruminant. I think that's one area of research that we really do need to work on for sloths. So just pointing that out there because I think there's still a lot that needs to be discussed when it comes to this. And these are the things that we think a lot about when we're talking about preventive health and just health in general for sloths. Excellent. So Dominique, this is all you. Yeah, so, so this, this picture here is um, from a former colleague of mine. And this is a sloth that's being worked on it's this completely voluntary behavior. And what um, the vet is doing here is actually drawing blood from the femoral vein, which is one of the ones, and we'll talk more about this under the um, preventive care section, where you draw blood from the sloth. And this is actually quite remarkable because this is a fairly large vessel and the sloth has been worked on for many months to get it to this point. And I put it on there because it just shows the many things that you can do with these animals um, with the proper type of training and the, you know, the, the enthusiasm for training is certainly needed for this. Um, we'll show you some other pictures of sloths having voluntary radiographs, ultrasounds, um, you know, all kinds of things can be done with the animals when working with them properly. Um, so this is just a really good reminder that not everything has to be done under chemical restraint. 
Now, I will say, I would not necessarily recommend doing venipuncture with most sloths awake. Um, most sloths are not going to have the temperament that will allow this kind of invasive um, procedure. And I would consider a femoral blood draw pretty invasive um, because we're dealing with a large vessel that's also next to a large artery. So if you miss or have a, a malfunction during your, your inner draw, there is a higher risk. So this was done after many months of evaluating the animal's um, you know, temperament and capability under this kind of restraint. But we wanted to put this here because the next series of slides really talks a lot about what we do for anesthesia or deep sedation, but not everything needs to be done under that um, those conditions. And it's nice to have the options to do this without um, chemical restraint if we can. So for chemical restraint, uh, we chatted about this a little ahead of time. Um, there are some differences between what's reported in the literature and what we might do um, in everyday practice. I know that um, what I tend to go for is ketamine and dexmedetomidine combinations uh, with or without the addition of midazolam. Um, and then for analgesia, I've used mostly um, meloxicam for that purpose. I think in some of the, the papers in the field, um, telazole has been used. So it's letamine zolazepam or zolatil is the other brand name um, because of it, it works, it functions, um, and it's readily available and has a relatively wide margin of safety or um, ketamine and metatomidine combinations uh, have been used. Dominique, have you used... Uh, this, uh, the others are from Zims, is that right? Correct. So most of these things will be legacy now because um, we tend to want to use, for example, for the anesthetic induction, something reversible. Um, it's a lot more complicated to reverse. Well, you couldn't reverse all of the telozole or the zoletil. Um, but with the alpha-2 agonists like dexmedetomidine and metatomidine, those are reversible. So that's what we like to be able to use sort of balanced anesthesia. I, my preference is almost always to go with the ketamine dexmedetomidine plus or minus midazolam. Um, but even just the two, the first two drugs there are, are an amazing combination. For young animals, I think you can get away with inhalant only. And I think a lot of people still do that. Um, my preference for a large animal is to not do the inhalant only, but because you use a lot of inhalant. But the injectables work really, really well in the field as well as in managed care. And then for the second list, we're, we're talking about these analgesics. The most commonly used one is probably meloxicam um, because it has a, a really pretty good safety margin. Um, it's also readily available in injectable and oral forms. Um, flunixin is used mostly in ruminants now. It's an older drug, um, has a lot of uses and different purposes depending on what kind of treatment you're going for. And then the three remaining here are legacy drugs, I think, um, that we're not using as much. But again, we're working in North America, so probably the availability is going to be different depending on where you are. And then the use of the opioids, um, Pete, I don't know if you remember, I've definitely used buprenorphine to great success in sloths, uh, and I'm pretty sure I've used tramadol in at least one case. Yeah, I've used uh, buprenorphine in one case of a sloth I was managing for bloat. And then here for maintenance, this is, uh, this is one of your cases, right? It is. So when we're talking about chemical restraint, you know, the debate is always once you have the animal under full anesthesia, do you put an endotracheal tube in place? And there are some places, some institutions that say it's absolutely mandatory. It's part of a protocol. I will tell you that for the most part, I'm doing fairly quick procedures in sloths. I just face mask them with uh, flow by oxygen because I've used an injectable combination. So the anesthetic is injectable. I'm just maintaining them on oxygen. I don't necessarily intubate. Um, other people will tell you it's also difficult to intubate sloths, and I think it's not necessarily difficult, but it is tricky, and you just need to be prepared when you're doing it. So a lot of people intubate them. Um, I've even intubated them in the field. It's definitely doable. You just need to be prepared to push aside a lot of the very abundant soft palatal tissue. So when you're looking down the, the, the throat of the sloth, and you're using your laryngoscope to open their mouth, and Pete has a really great picture in, it in one of the slides coming up, you'll see how long that palate is. And when you get to the point where you're trying to visualize the larynx, um, and this is a little bit specialized, for those of you who've done this, you'll understand what I mean better than those of you that haven't done it. You need to push aside the top of the, the roof of their mouth to be able to see the larynx. So I usually use um, like a popsicle stick or a, um, some kind of you know, wooden applicator to get that out of the way. Use the laryngoscope then to pry open the jaw, and then you can usually see pretty well to get in there. Um, we're talking probably sizes of three, three and a half to four. Um, for your endotracheal tubes. And again, any of this kind of specialized detail you guys have questions with, we can certainly answer offline too. 
and then for the IV catheters, we were talking about this as well. I think that I placed one in a cephalic vein of a, of a small animal, um, but the trick there is trying to maintain it. And I don't think I was able to maintain it because of the anatomy. Once you woke up from anesthesia and started moving, there was no way to, to hold that patent. I think that it might be possible, especially if you bandage the arm, um, but in, in this case, it, it wasn't. But it is for longer procedures, I think it would be worthwhile. But Dominic, like you said, I think everything that I'm doing in slots is fairly quick um, for most indications. And so for monitoring, um, it's fairly straightforward, similar to other species. Um, their core body temperature, <clears throat> if you're doing um, like a rectal um, thermometer is going to be, can be lower than, than most eutherian mammals. Um, part of that might be because of the lower metabolism of the sloth. Another part might be because of the, the location of the, the anus or the presence of a lot of fecal matter um, there. For monitoring heart rates, um, to expect that the heart rate is going to be a lot slower than you might expect for a similarly sized mammal. Um, and it might sound relatively faint and that's going to be normal, so not to panic. Um, pulse oximetry, I've placed probes on the ear, um, on the pinna, on the tongue, um, on the folds of the, the vulva. And then for direct observation, for monitoring um, respiration, if you don't have capnography, so if you're, the animal's not intubated, and then electrocardiography like in any other species. I put here with a question mark, oscillometric blood pressure, because you can place um, a blood pressure cuff on an arm. Um, however, I don't think that they're, um, for two-toed sloths, they haven't been validated against like a gold standard, like uh, getting a central blood pressure. And so you, if, if you look at the, the numbers empirically, they might not re accurately reflect what's happening inside the animal. And so we always say that you can use it for trends um, and it's not wrong to use, but I would be hesitant to make uh, clinical decisions based on just like a single reading. And then I'll say that for recovery, um, if you're using uh, an alpha-2 agonist, uh, agonist like uh, dexmedetomidine or metatomidine, you could reverse that with adipamazole. Um, if you do use midazolam, flamazinol can be used uh, for reversal. It's important to maintain thermal support um, throughout the recovery period because of that low body temperature, because typically the environmental, like the ambient temperature in your exam room is going to be a lot lower than what it would be in this animal's natural habitat or on their, um, in their uh, home enclosure. And then we contain, um, contain the animal until they're able to support themselves. I could tell you in this picture here, so I'm um, waking this animal up and you can see that I'm holding his hand through his very harrowing ordeal of his annual preventative care exam, um, but he's still well under anesthesia, so I'm not really risking um, too much by holding holding his hand that way will basically um, restrain them until they start to show a little bit of muscle tone once the reversal agents have been given, and then move them into like a large um, a large kennel or uh, with uh, perching until they're able to um, hold themselves up or show interest in um, in perching normally before we move them move them back. One thing that I did not know, so I have not worked with um, free ranging slots, and Dominique was telling me. Um, before this, that apparently their claws are a lot sharper. So if you've never worked with a free ranging sloth, they have very sharp nails. If you've never worked with um, a sloth under managed care, I can tell you that those nails were rather blunt and not that that sharp. And I think that's probably um, an effect of, um, of the perching that's used and the way that they're using their, their claws, not because we're necessarily uh, doing anything to them, like filing them or something. Okay, this is all me. So agreed, yeah, if you're if you're in the range countries, you know, you don't hold sloths that way if they're awake because you will get cut. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, so as we're transitioning into the next section of the talk, where we start talking a little bit about um, conditions associated with um, different organ systems, I wanted to kind of set the scene a little bit, um, not too in depth, just enough to kind of get us there. So I'm, I work off of ZIMS, which is the Zoological Information uh, Management System that our zoo uses. 
Um, and I just mined that to get a little bit of data. I wanted to know how many places have sloths that are in um, the, the Zims network, which is worldwide, and that's 294 at the moment. That's just for the generic two-fingered sloths. It didn't really go into different species uh, for this. And that's 789 individuals. That's a lot of sloths. Um, so theoretically, that's a lot of data. Um, and you can mine Zims for other things, but I just wanted you guys to get a perspective. That's a lot of sloths being held in managed care just in this group alone. And that doesn't obviously include all the ones that are held in smaller zoos that are not part of that network or, you know, um, in other institutions that maybe not even qualify as zoos. And it certainly obviously doesn't talk about the rehab centers or the range country rehab centers that are doing amazing work. Um, so I wanted to give us the perspective over history. And the truth is there's not a ton of recent, recent data as it comes to what are the causes of morbidity and mortality in this, in this group of sloths um, in managed care specifically. But I was able to um, find this, this is a slightly older review and Pete and I were talking about this earlier. We probably need to update this. This is probably our jobs going forward. So back in 2001, two authors put together um, a retrospective to look and see what was the morbidity and mortality for this uh, group of sloths over this period of time. So the Moran Lambersky paper from 2001 sort of highlights what are the big things. And I really only picked one group of sloths and that's the sloths that are over 15 years of age just to kind of give us some representative data. And you can see that at that time in 2001, the biggest areas of concern would have been um, the GI tract, which is still the case. Um, the urinary tract, especially for causes of death, which is still very much the case. Um, and then you can see how much data is unknown, right? Those two red bars here on the far right are telling us we still have a lot of research to do. Um, so a lot of uh, what I call, the, the, it's not so much a clinical science as a clinical art when it comes to sloth workups. There's still so much that we need to know, but just keep your minds on what are the two biggest issues. And as you'll see as we work through this, it's GI issues and urinary issues. Now, if we look at a different study from Brazil, they did a 20 year retrospective, but it's mostly skewed towards bradypus. Um, and again, here, slightly different perspective, although I guess you could combine nutritional and gastrointestinal into one category. And if you do that, just look and see how much um, of the concerns are due to, you know, GI basically. Um, and then I point out here that they don't even mention renal as one of the biggest causes of problems for in their study, but look at respiratory. It, it's pretty high. And I think historically, this has been a very big issue. It's a bigger concern. I think the younger the sloth, um, I don't see it as much of a bigger concern right now when I get cases um, that I consult on. Um, but it has been a big problem, I think, in the past for adult sloths, and it, I think, remains a big problem for really small or young sloths. Is this me? <laughs> I can make both of us. I, I wanted to just add, I'll, I'll start first, Pete, and you can continue sure. if you want. Um, so if you've worked with sloths in the wild, you know that a lot of them, at least when they come into care, usually are green, um, especially the, the three-fingered sloths. Um, and that's because of that sort of symbiotic slash commensal relationship they have with sloths and moths and uh, their own little microenvironment. But you don't see that um, in sloths in managed care. I've never seen a zoo sloth with anything green on it. Um, and then I put in there, they have little subcutaneous space, which has relevance for treatment. If you're trying to give them subcutaneous fluids, which is our, usually our go-to approach when you're trying to do something relatively non-invasive, um, it's very challenging to get much in terms of fluids below there because that subcutaneous space is very, very tight, kind of like a human. There's just not a lot of space there to give fluids. You can do it, um, but you're going to want to massage that space quite a bit to make sure the fluid distributes and doesn't cause you know pain or distress. Um, I've seen historically a lot more cases of trauma in the literature than I think we see, but if there's any agonistic behavior between sloths, you'll definitely have cases of trauma. They will bite each other, and you'll see, um, if you don't have an already for personal experience, how sharp their teeth are, um, and they can cause a lot, a lot of damage. Um, Pete's already talked a little bit about nails. Um, in managed care, I think we do see a lot of overgrown nails. They're not climbing as much as they would um, in the wild. And then as they start to have problems with their nails, it seems like it does cause basically a prolonged problem. I think once nails start to be malformed, they never really come back to normal. Um, one of my uh, colleagues in Panama told me that once you start trimming nails, they'll never really grow back normally. I don't have personal experience with that, but I'm just throwing that out there. Um, but in managed care, we often end up having to trim some nails because they are not growing normally uh, and they're just not wearing them enough. And then I've had several sloths with dry skin, and I think that's because a lot of them are living in environments that don't provide the sufficient humidity. We have a lot of challenges providing them with enough humidity to manage, match what they would have in range countries. The foot pads, especially in these guys, um, can get really, really dry. 
and we just use topical emollients on them. And that usually seems to manage, but you know, really you need to adjust the humidity as best you can to probably prevent that or at least reduce the incidence of that. Yeah, I've definitely seen that as well. We use a lot of um, mineral oil and fractionated coconut oil that we've used topically on them. Some of them will even allow us to do it like conscious. Do you use other things, other products? And we've used everything from something called Corona ointment um, to Vaseline to mm -hmm. coconut oil is a big favorite because if they lick it, it's no big deal. Yeah. Um, those are our favorites. Yeah, anything that's not the water based emollients don't really work as well, I think, as the sort of fat emollients. Yeah. So this is uh, great. So when we started like our physical exam, um, looking at the eyes, it's normal for them to have these round pinpoint pupils. Um, I took this this picture of this sloth and you could see just like from the way that the eyes are bulging and how wide um, they are that she's rather stressed, she's scared. Um, I really like included this image though, because you could actually make out the, the pupils, which are so small. Um, if you're lucky, you'll never see dilated pupils in a sloth. Um, it's been described as something that happens right before they die as a sign of like pain and, and basically it's what a more bun sloth might look like. Um, and from at least one case that I've had, I could confirm that. Um, the uh, Basically, it was a, a case of a sloth that had bloat, and she followed the almost like the textbook of what you would expect in the clinical signs that that she showed. And despite like intensive treatments um, before she died, her pupils were quite dilated. Um, these are colorblind animals because they have rod monochromacy, um, and you could see white ocular discharge um, from the eyes in times of stress or um, uh, like high excitement. And then they have these perfect little gnome ears. Look how beautiful they are. Great for placing um, a pulse oximetry uh, clip to. Their nose, um, some scant clear discharge, I think can be normal in some slots. Um, but if you get profuse discharge, especially if it's unilateral or if there are crusts or mucoid discharge um, from the nares, those are. Um, those could be signs of respiratory infections. And like we mentioned before, it's pretty common, especially historically in sloths to have uh, respiratory infections. Dominique, if you wanna throw in anything, please feel free to cut me oh, off. Got it. <laughs> Otherwise I'm gonna keep trucking. Um, so when we look at their dentition, uh, their dentition is quite interesting. I guess all this and Arthurans have interesting dentition, right? Um, they have uh, homodont teeth, so they're continuously growing. They lack enamel, so they're actually relatively soft um, and they grind against each other. Uh, they do have in the front these um, two maxillary, two mandibular caniniform teeth. So those are the sharp ones that look like canines. Um, we can see sometimes that uh, problems from either uh, crowns of teeth that overgrow or that might be malocluded. And so this, you might see signs of dysphagia, so um, difficulty prehending food, chewing or swallowing food. You might see oral ulceration um, from where points of teeth are basically scraping against the tongue or the, the cheek um, and causing uh, uh, oral ulcers. And those require therapeutic crown reduction. Um, so basically um, filing, and you could use a rotary device like a, a Dremel I've used, or even small like hand rasps or files, um, something like a metallic emery board. I found this paper, which I thought was interesting because I was trying to pin down um, the dental formula for slots. And it turns out that the number of teeth uh, may vary and it's, uh, not uncommon to see either supernumerary teeth. So you see slots that have extra teeth um, on one arcade, but not the other, or that might be missing a tooth in one arcade, but, but not the other. And that's not necessarily um, a sign of disease. And so uh, here's an image that I took of a sloth that was under anesthesia and we're doing the exam, but you could see basically looking all the way back into the oropharynx um, that, um, 
that really like uh, abundant um, tissue that Dominique was talking about um, that could complicate intubation. And then you see those, um, those four caniniform teeth that they um, scrape against each other and kind of grind each other down and file each other down to, to points. So this slide is from one of my former patients and it's showing you a couple of things. Um, if you haven't looked in this lost mouse before, and this was the first one you saw, I mean, you'd be really worried because the they don't have enamel, as we pointed out, the dentin stains variably. So that center area of dentin is slightly different from the outer ring of dentin, um, but that's normal. So that's not a cavity, it's not a, a bad tooth. Um, but the dentist that I was working with at the time was probing because he was unfamiliar with this. And then we were pointing out that this is actually perfectly normal for them. Um, but what's not normal is this, is this picture on the right. And so this same sloth on the other side, on this arcade, um, you can see that this uh, you know, cheek tooth has quite a large point. And that's because of malocclusion on the opposite arcade above it. So you know, a small dental burr or a Dremel um, is enough to remove that. Anytime they lose teeth or the teeth are not even, you're going to have that abnormal wear. But you can just see how traumatic that point would be, right? You don't have to think very hard how, how painful that would be. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll just start dropping food or not eating as well. And, you know, whenever you have that kind of condition, the first thing you should think about is what's going on in their mouth. So just moving on down, going from like head to, to tail, um, tail. Looking at their thorax, um, this we monitor by auscultation, just like you would in any other mammal. You can see from this uh, radiograph here that they do have like these small, tiny, like puny little chests, right? Because they're not necessarily nature's athletes, so they don't necessarily need like a lot of aerobic capacity. They're going to devote most of their body to their fermentation vats, right? So to their GI tract. Um, their respiratory rate can vary 13 to 14 um, uh, beats per minute, according to the one study. Um, and respiratory infections are relatively common. Uh, we think that for the most part, these are secondary to either inadequate nutrition, poor environment. Um, it could be difficult when trying to provide that high ambient humidity to also provide adequate ventilation and providing uh, appropriately clean air. And then you have different um, bacterial infections that have been reported, including Bordetella bronchoseptica, which is the typical causative agent of like kennel cough in dogs. So it's something that's circulating in, in pet populations and definitely a point of contact or a point of um, uh, a source of infection, not directly, but maybe indirectly to our slots. And then historically, pneumonia has been a, a significant cause of, of morbidity, so of sickness in captive sloths. Dominique, I don't know, do you have anything to add before I move on? Yeah, my, my, my gut feeling is that the issues with pneumonia and respiratory disease were probably a lot to do with the fact that we didn't really have a very good handle on, um, you know, the proper housing conditions. The temperature and humidity probably played a significant uh, role in that. And I think that's why we're seeing less and less of that, because at least people are better at sharing information on what's what's a good environment for a sloth and managed care. That, that's my, my going yeah. on. And then looking at uh, cardiac, so heart rate between 70 and 130 beats per minute. Um, it could be even lower than that when they're anesthetized. Um, degenerative cardiac disease has been associated with arterial mineralization or atherosclerosis, um, which is uh, something that we'll also talk about a, a, a little bit later when we talk about um, vitamin D homeostasis and sloths. And then you can see this from a pathology paper. Um, it shows uh, an enlarged heart, which is like on the top left of the screen. And then the um, that aorta that's coming off of it is quite dilated and um, completely mineralized. And this is an interesting case of myocardial failure, and I'm not going to do it justice, so I'm going to pass that baton to you. <laughs> well, this was also an archive dive that I, I found this case. Now, there are a few reports of cardiac disease in sloths. Um, it's not super common. In some cases, I think it probably is mostly related to the mineralization that is in this picture. But um, this is the paper by Sushan Han and Garner. And I mean, that's a pretty significant amount of mineralization that you're seeing in that dilated aorta. But this case of myocardial failure is interesting because it's really the only reported case we have of something slightly different. 
Um, and I think it leaves us with more questions than answers. Um, so this sloth uh, in a southern state uh, presented with edema and ascites. So edema is when you know you touch the skin and there's just like a lot of fluid under there. But it also had abundant um, fluid in its abdomen, and that's the ascites part of it. When they uh, ultrasounded and radiographed it, they found that the heart was significantly enlarged compared to reference ranges looking at another sloth they had in care. Um, and then the lung pattern was what we call bronchointerstitial, which we typically see with cardiac disease or heart failure. And where it gets questionable, and I don't think they knew the answer to this, and we don't really have a good resolution to this case in terms of definitive answers, is did this sloth have heartworm or diarophilaria imidis? At least that's, that's the species of heartworm we have here in North America. Um, if you read this case carefully, it sounds like they had a high suspicion of it, but we're never able to fully diagnose that or confirm it. But I brought this up because I have consulted with another case, also in a southern state, I think with an imported sloth, where the there were several larvae seen on blood uh, films. And that's an, one way we diagnose heartworm in dogs is also by looking at, you know, actually blood samples collected from that animal that's infected. And usually there's quite a few larvae. Um, so it's unclear to me whether this was heartworms. I think it was unclear to the authors as well. But I think it behooves us to re remember this. Um, and, and depending on where you are, do, you know, do you need to worry about treating for heartworms? I suspect it's very, very unlikely. We'll never really know from this answer. But this animal definitely had cardiac failure um, and was successfully treated with multiple cardiac medications, including ACE inhibitors, um, uh, Lasix or furosemide. I think it was on amlodipine, and actually lived and, and was doing much better. In fact, the bronchospecial pattern resolved with treatment. So we know this can be treated. We just don't know what caused it. Um, heartworms, possibly. Um, it doesn't sound like this was a case of aortic or other mineralization, but we can't rule it out because there isn't any follow-up data on this case. But it is an interesting one. So the GI tract is probably the, like, one of the more studied um, or uh, interest, like, organ systems of interest in sloths, right? Because um, it is quite unique and so much of their adaptations is really devoted to like how they're going to digest this like high fiber, low energy food. So um, sloths are foregut fermenters. Um, there might be like some fermentation that happens in other parts of the, um, the GI tract for the but for the most part, it's going to be in the stomach, which is multi-chambered and sacculated. So the stomach and its contents can make up up to 25% of the body weight of the animal. And generally, like if we're to look at the stomach like functionally and anatomically, we could talk about the anterior or proximal portion of the stomach, which is the squamous chambers, and then the posterior or distal portion of the stomach, which is the, the glandular chamber or the prepyloric um, glandular chamber. And you could see this is a great diagram that um, came from out of the, the National Aquarium um, from a publication that uh, Deb Dial worked on <clears throat> and published in a, a Zookeeper newsletter um, that shows the, the way that the stomach and all of its um, portions are going to sit in, in like an anatomically correct position in the body of the sloth. So in the image, we're looking at the sloth from um, the ventral aspect, and you could see um, how the basically the stomach is folded on itself. Um, when you take radiographs, when you do imaging, when you do your physical exam, it's normal to have this larger um, ingestive filled chamber um, cranially, and then you're gonna see like loops of intestines um, and then the bladder distally. So when we look at this, why do we care when we talk about like in our medical management? It's important because it might change the types of antibiotics that we use. Knowing that they're foregut fermenters, they're really relying on their, their natural flora in their, most importantly, in the anterior part of their GI tract in order to digest their food. And so if we're giving antibiotics orally, enterally, um, we don't want to cause a dysbiosis they do require high fiber, lower sugar diets. So we try to stay away from those diets that are um, high in easily digestible carbohydrates and move more towards like the long chain carbohydrates. So the fiber, which is why going back to originally when we were talking about nutrition, why it's so important for the, the long-term health of the animal. 
they are prone to um, gastric dilatation, um, known as bloat and, and volvulus. And so um, when we talk about bloat, it is that the, the stomach basically fills or with uh, gas, so there's a rapid gas accumulation, and just from the pressure of the, the gas that's in the stomach alone, you start to have impairment of blood flow, not just to the stomach, but then to other organs, because it's both putting pressure, it's putting pressure on the diaphragm, so the animal's having a hard time breathing. It's putting pressure on the caudal vena cava, and so you're having a difficult time of returning blood to the heart from the rest of the body, and then the vessels that supply blood to the stomach itself are then being compressed by the gas that's inside the stomach. And that's what, what really causes um, the majority of the clinical signs that eventually will lead to, to death in many cases. Um, volvulus is something that, uh, the, this is kind of how I ended up here tonight, is because I had a case where volvulus is following, we believe that it follows bloat, that following bloat, the stomach then flips on itself and rotates, and that cuts off circulation completely and death follows um, fairly rapidly. And uh, Dominique and I and uh, two co-authors published a, a case series on that. Um, there were only three cases in that, but anecdotally, since publishing it, talking to other colleagues, find out that actually it might be a little bit more common than what, um, than what we thought. Uh, because of their, their GI strategy is really set up to extract the most amount of nutrients from the food that they eat, um, which for them is going to take a lot of time, which means that their GI transit time is quite slow um, from the time that they eat something to the time that they defecate it out, um, could take up to several days because it's going to spend a lot of time in the stomach as the stomach breaks it down and the microbes in the stomach break it down they're only going to let smaller and smaller particles pass through hence the different chambers of the stomach um, to that end uh, it's important to know that the sloth is only going to defecate really like every three to seven days and that part of that adaptation um, has less to do with gi transit time and more to do with um or considered an adaptation to our arboreal life. So they only have to descend to the forest floor from, you know, the canopy um, only every three to seven days in order to relieve themselves. The extensiveness of the GI tract, because it's so big, it can limit abdominal ultrasonography um, because of the gas that's normally present in the GI tract can then like block the, the view of your, your sound waves if you're trying to do ultrasounds. The, um, that document that we were talking about, the nutrition guidelines for two-toed sloths, um, has this great um, scoring uh, guide for um, for feces, for, for sloth feces. And this is great, especially if you're working with an animal care team, or even if you're working with in a multi-doctor practice, to have the same language to be able to describe the feces that you're seeing. So to try to qualify um, what you're looking at, what's normal, what's unformed, um, what's loose. So going back to talking about um, bloat, because it is relatively common, um, your signs, your clinical signs are usually those of discomfort. Sometimes you see dyspnea, um, the animal rather than um, hanging upside down in a normal position might actually try to um, stay upright with its um, head up uh, upwards, like in a vertical position to try to um, help it to breathe and remove the pressure from it from its diaphragm. Um, oftentimes, the clinical signs are rather cryptic in, in the animal, so it's hard to tell exactly like when they're they're painful. Your plan really needs to be to relieve the dissension as quickly as possible. Um, the uh, simethicone is a surfactant that can be used orally. And the idea is that if the animal um, has uh, usually like a high amount of protein in the in the stomach at the time, that protein then creates like a um, stronger water tension. And so it could trap bubbles, kind of if you think about like foam in the ocean, right? Um, so we call that like frothy bloat. The simethicone is a surfactant that's going to break down those bubbles and allow the animal to eructate or to at least burp and um, leave some of that gas. 
for gastric volvulus, usually um, it's going to be sudden death. And so if you look at this picture, this is actually one of the co-authors on that paper, um, where on the necropsy, you see that that tissue that's twisted there. And that's like the root of the mesentery, like um, near the stomach. And it shows you that basically he just, the stomach flipped and twisted um, entirely and cutting off circulation. And so that animal died um, before intervention could be instituted. And then regarding um, diarrhea, I think diarrhea is also a uh, relatively common. Um, I'll, I could let Dominique talk about it, but I know that, you know, Dominique, you've told me that you get a lot of questions from practitioners and clinicians that are, are um, working with sloths that are present for, for diarrhea. Um, the diagnostic plan, I think, is the, the standard, you know, blood work, fecal exam, culture the feces for enteric pathogens. Um, and then treatment plan relying heavily on fluid therapy and nutritional support, um, judicious use of antibiotics. Um, Dominic, you want to talk about the fecal transformation? Yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. Diarrhea is probably currently the number one thing people actually reach out to me about um, for cases that they have at zoos. Um, again, my gut feeling, pun intended, is that it's often secondary to something else. Um, so I think uh, there's a question in the chat, like how often should they poo if they poo more frequently? You may not have diarrhea, but I would encourage you if you have diarrhea or more frequent defecation than what you think is normal for a sloth is to really closely evaluate um, the, the diet and just see what you're offering um, and then figure out, you know, in the case of frequent defecation, um, are, they, are they actually defecating more frequently or urinating more frequently? Is there something else going on? But the, for the diarrhea, I mean, the workup can be quite complex and I think it's very challenging because once they start having diarrhea, it typically can go downhill pretty quickly. It may not result in a sudden death that you'll see with the volvulus case, but um, these are usually very, very ill sloths, um, and they can have diarrhea for a long time before they do succumb, but they're poor doers when it comes to that point. So as Pete points out, the treatment plan includes all these things. Um, the fecal transplantation is, is interesting and definitely worth a mention because I do get a lot of questions about it. How is it done? What does it do? Um, and the first thing I tell people is there's no actual research on it yet, but anecdotally, um, it does seem to be helping sloths. Now, how long the duration of effect is seems to vary in this paper here from um, Picker and uh, et al. Uh, at least at the time of publication, their sloth was off transplantation for seven months and had normal feces, um, but required, I think, four, at least four rounds of fecal transplantation. So it's a challenge because if you're planning to do this, you need to have a donor who is healthy um, you've done all the fecal exams to rule out, make sure there's no parasitic issues or things that could be transferred to your recipient sloth. Um, but you also want to transplantate, you know, pretty much in real time if you can. If you can't, then maybe having, <clears throat> excuse me, feces overnighted to you, if that's an option, are probably the next best thing. Um, and in this paper here, they actually did, I think, freeze dry the, the feces, but the, the recommendations are usually to feed frozen, uh, not frozen, sorry, fresh, uh, not frozen feces. Um, probably, and I think Deb Dial's um, website has some pretty good recommendations, at least in terms of like some of the practical aspects of this, like what's worked in giving feces to sloth. Some things they'll accept orally, for example, gel diets where you mix the feces in there, not so much, but a slurry with um, you know, herbivore critical care works better or a slurry with some of the other preferred diet items also works. Um, but you're typically giving the fecal transplantation at about two grams per kilo of sloth every day for several days, ideally something like seven to 14 days, if you can do that, um, just to try to really get that to take. Um, and what this paper was showing was as a result of the transplantation, and this is what you hope with and transplantation, is that the recipient's uh, microbiome starts to mimic that of the, uh, the, the donor. And you should be seeing more variety rather than a, like a monotypic growth of certain types of bacteria. And the next generation sequencing that's coming out now, I think is probably going to supplant eventually fecal culture and gives you a lot more bang for your buck. Um, and if anybody wants to ask about that, we could talk about that offline. But fecal transplantation, in the same way that it's sort of revolutionizing, I think a lot of human medicine is probably going to be having a bigger impact than we think. Um, but for animals like our foregut fermenters, it has a lot of really important uh, implications, I think. The probiotics I put there with the question mark, I mean, the issue with probiotics is that typically you'd want to give something that was species specific as you could get it, but what does that mean for a sloth? We don't know. So, you know, probably something that's a probiotic formulated for a ruminant is our closest and best guess. Um, but there are so many varieties of probiotics out there. It's probably any one is as good as the other, as long as you're giving, you know, large enough quantities of it 
Um, it certainly can't hurt. And I think that's probably the maximum we use it under is it can't hurt. So let's give it. Um, but, you know, hopefully in the, in the future, we'll have some better idea what are the be best probiotics to give animals that are either having diarrhea or potentially you're giving it when they're on antibiotics, um, that kind of thing. This uh, always makes me smile because there's at least one report in the literature of um, an animal that was believed to be one one sex and then um, on necropsy was found to be another. Um, just to give you an idea of how difficult it might be to, uh, to accurately uh, uh, determine their sex from their external genitalia. Although there are um, lots of resources and you know, phone a friend or Google pictures of external genitalia, as you can see here, in order to try to um, make that determination. So the reproduction is not strictly seasonal, um, meaning that in captivity, they've been reported to, to reproduce in various times of year. Um, gestation is about 10 months, nine to 10 months, uh, depending on the, the species that you're, you're looking at. And uh, the dam, tends to have uh, only one offspring at a time. The, it's pretty interesting when they come out because they look like they're quite altricial, um, but they can start eating solid food as early as their, their first week of life, um, even though they might continue to nurse off of mom up to six months or, or more. Their independence is around nine to 12 months, and I could say that like for a lot of our animals in captivity around like that time is when you see the dam starting to show, um, uh, if not outright aggressive behavior, but um, antagonistic behavior towards the offspring in order to like encourage them to, to disperse. Um, most of our cells are kept singly. Um, their sexual maturity is relatively delayed compared to um, compared to when they wean. So usually between like two to four years at the earliest. Um, I did not include it here, but in terms of lifespan, um, Dominique, I don't know what you know off the top of your head, but I could say that we have at least one sloth here at the zoo that's um, well into his mid fifties, uh, yep. like as of now. Yep, agreed. Very long lived and managed care. This is your beautiful ultrasound picture. <laughs> my ultrasound picture, one of my male sloths. Um, so this is a fun one because it shows, one, the very large urinary bladder. So obviously this large black uh, part of the image is the bladder, very full, which is very helpful when you're doing an ultrasound. It certainly highlights the internal organs. Um, but what's happening here is this is a good one. I like this one because you can actually see both testes uh, at the same time. And they are obviously internal. Um, and there they are nicely lining up um, right next to the urinary bladder. So this was a fun image to take. Uh, males have a prostate, they have paired seminal vesicles. This is probably of, of relatively little clinical relevance to most of us, but it's important to know the anatomy as best you can. So I'm pointing that out here. Um, the females have um, a uterus simplex, two ovaries, um, nothing fairly complicated. They have a, like a vestibule. Um, and then in terms of placentation, it's a fairly typical endothelial placentation. I have seen one case of dystocia that was managed uh, conservatively. We were able to extract the baby. Um, I believe there's at least one case report of a C-section. I don't know if it was successful or not. And some of you might have some more experience than we do with this, but I have seen it um, and we were able to take care of that baby. But, um, you know, it's just important to know what you can see out there. I'm calling you out because this is your paper. <laughs> I forgot. Well, it was actually Pete Black's paper. He was the primary author. But this is a, we, so, yeah, we've mentioned this before, and you've seen the ultrasound image. They, they can have a huge amount of urine um, in their bladders. Um, and the first time you ultrasound a sloth, you will be astounded, um, unless they've just gone to the restroom, in which case you won't be. Um, and urination typically aligns with defecation. So if they've just defecated, then you probably will not see a large bladder. But it is astounding, the amounts of urine. Um, that they can produce. And that urine can either be, you know, what we'll, let's say a urine specific gravity of sloth is about 10, 20, um, but often it's um, less than that and it doesn't seem to be a, an issue. So I think we're still working on the reference ranges. We tried to establish some um, in this paper, giving us a better idea like what to look for in your sloths and managed care. Um, but definitely there is some variability. And I think a part of it just depends on how long the urine's been in the bladder, how you're collecting it. 
um, and what the sloth's diet and, and water availability is. Um, but there seems to be quite a bit of variability in her urine concentration, which is one of the parameters we use to see like what their renal status is. Um, and this paper was kind of trying to establish some of those additional parameters, comparing them to blood work, as well as some other um, diagnostics within the blood work to compare them to renal issues. As I mentioned, those are very common in sloths. I included this picture just to put it into perspective. If you look at the um, the bladder on the like the bottom part of that that image, you can see that it's almost like a, a third of the size of the stomach, and it's not even completely full. Just to give you an idea of like how distended it could become um, when they're when it's full. And then looking at like other aspects of the urinary tract, like they could ha have um, urinary tract infections that are completely asymptomatic. Um, they might present with increased frequency of urination, um, which is a very subtle change when you realize that they're only urinating every three to eight days. Um, and increased frequency might be like uh, difficult to, to pick up on unless you're monitoring um, quite carefully. Cystic calculi have been uh, reported, so bladder stones. Um, and again, in many cases, these were found incidentally on exam. Um, there are reports of chronic renal disease, which um, really presents similarly to other species where the animal becomes um, azotemic with an elevated uh, urea nitrogen um, or creatinine, and then renal neoplasia has also been described. And so this picture, you see like this cross-section of the kidney um, on the outside is the cortex and that pink inside is the medulla, and then all those white spots um, represent renal mineralization. Um, which I think we're talking about next. Oh, here you go. All right. So this is, I just wanted to include this because it's pretty significant mineralization in a fairly young sloth. Um, this is a sloth that came from a breeder, um, unknown, but it was definitely not uh, from a range country. Um, and this sloth, I think at this time we took the picture was 10. So that's pretty young. Um, but look at within the blue circles here on left and right, that's some um, mineralization of, the, of the, uh, the whole pelvis of both kidneys, both kidneys. So just imagine what that's going to do for his renal function uh, as he gets older. He already has some changes um, in his kidney values on blood work, but they're really relatively stable at this point. He's not showing any clinical signs, but, you know, this is something that this loss came to us with um, and probably had to do with some dietary issues in his past. And then in the green circle is just some incidental, I mean, at this point, mineralization, probably in one of those areas of his GI tract. And I just point that out because, you know, the first time we saw it, we thought, well, what is that? But then when you correlate that to what you can see on the, the radiograph uh, images of the kidney, it's, it's pretty significant. So something to watch for. And as you've seen throughout this talk, mineralization can happen pretty much in any organ system. We've seen it in adrenals, uh, cardiovascular system, GI tract, um, you know, blood vessels. Um, sometimes you'll even see changes in the bone structure when it's pretty severe, um, abnormal mineralization. So it's it's something to be aware of. And again, kidney issues, or at least secondary or primary, are one of the, it's probably the most important thing we worry about with sloths. Moving on to musculoskeletal, um, uh, body condition is difficult to assess. There's no validated body condition scoring system for sloths, um, so it's kind of... Uh, subjective. It's difficult due to their anatomy. There's not a lot of uh, subcutaneous fat. Um, and so if they're, you have like, if they're putting down fat, it's going to be internally. And then their body weight varies so much with defecation and urination. And so you really have to look when you're trying to assess um, the body condition of a sloth, besides looking at the, like holistically at the entire animal, um, going on body weight alone, you have to really look at that longitudinally. So you have to look at it over time and see what the animal is doing because you could see vast, um, like precipitous drops in weight, like after they defecate, after they urinate. Um, and so uh, just a single point in time is not gonna be particularly useful. The nails um, can be prone to injury, especially depending on the um, substrate or the that they're provided or the perching materials that they're provided. Um, they're known to get caught in either um, metal grates of like um, fencing or of like frayed rope um, that they could get entangled in. And so once they're once they're damaged, um, they might not regrow normally. 
And so I have this radiograph. If you look, um, this is from one of our animals here. You could see that the, the most distal um, phalangeal bone, so P3, really provides like most of the scaffolding for that nail. So we, when we look at the nail, we see the um, keratin sheath. And you see underneath, there's, there's a bone that's supporting that. And so when that nail breaks, and you can see the red arrow is pointing to, um, to uh, one of those digits, that most of that bone is lost. And so the germinal tissue is still there. Maybe even the base or the most proximal part of that bone is still there. But um, the bone is not going to regrow. And so the germinal tissue that's producing that keratin is going to continue to to produce the keratin, but there's no scaffolding. And so that uh, nail could grow in any direction that, that it wants. Um, most of those animals do very well, in, at least in captivity, um, and seem to ambulate and, and navigate their enclosures just fine. Okay, we keep talking about um, mineralization, right? We talked about it in the heart, we talked about it in the kidney, um, we see images of it in other organs like Dominique was just talking about. Um, what we, we think is that this is a, a, some sort of disorder of vitamin D homeostasis that we're seeing in our captive sloths. And so um, we know that they, are, they get bladder stones and this uh, one paper that, that came out, this pathology paper, showed that you could get soft tissue mineralization in sloths from as young as two months old to as old as 41 years. Um, it's been seen mostly in the cardiovascular system, um, like the heart and the great vessels, followed by uh, gastric tissue, so stomach tissue in the kidneys, and then even in the lungs. And so it really raises a lot of questions about their, their husbandry. Is there some underlying renal disease that's not being diagnosed? Is this nutritional? Is it um, because of the vitamin D that's in their, their captive diet, like Dominic was mentioning um, earlier? And so I'm kind of uh, summarizing several papers that have come out recently. And I know that there are some folks um, up at Cornell, uh, Dr. Charles Sanford, who's doing a lot of work on this topic. And so um, a brief review, we know that it doesn't seem that they produce vitamin D3 by photobiosynthesis, right? So we know that for us, we need exposure to ultraviolet light in order to um, produce the active form of vitamin D3 in our skin. And it does not seem to be the case with our, our sloths. And we care about this, especially because we keep them, a lot of times they're kept in fully indoor enclosures. And so they might not necessarily have um, access to, uh, to natural sunlight if access to um, ultraviolet um, light at all. And then we have some reported ranges for vitamin D3, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, parathyroid hormone, ionized calcium. And so these are all the components um, of the blood or many of the components of the blood that are like coming into play when we're talking about our calcium and our vitamin D homeostasis. We don't have, they don't necessarily meet the standards for reference ranges or reference intervals yet. Um, but at least we have uh, like that pilot study gives us some point of reference, right? And the one thing that I thought was interesting, and I thought this was kind of brilliant, is that it has been, um, they did validate the use of dried blood spots on filter paper to evaluate um, vitamin D. And there are a bunch of papers out there, many species where they're using dried blood spots on filter paper um, for any number of analytes. And I say this because it is very useful for field studies. So, um, Shout out to all, all of our colleagues that work out in the field. Um, to if it's not on your radar, um, then it's a great resource um, in order to be able to store samples long term without having to worry about refrigeration um, or uh, or processing. So one of the problems with whole blood samples is that the cells lice, right? They break up over time, and so they need to be analyzed in real time. Um, rather than stored long term. And this is one way of getting around that. And so it lends itself um, particularly well to, to field studies. And just a really brief touching on the adrenal glands because people have noted this and it is kind of weird in sloths. Um, normally the adrenal glands are located uh, cranial or just above the kidneys and kind of intimate association with them. But in sloths, they're not. Um, they're quite a ways away from the kidney. So this diagram kind of shows you where they would be anatomically um, for the most part, unless you probably don't need to know that. But um, should you ever have to necropsy a sloth, this is normal. 
Um, and there is this one case of hypoadrenocorticism or Addison's disease that comes up probably with every single slot case that I ever get consulted about. And it's an N of one, meaning there's only one case reported. Now that doesn't mean that there haven't been other cases. Um, either we just haven't tested for it. I, I suspect it's a, it's a pretty rare occurrence, um, but Addison seems to happen and across a lot of different species. So seeing a case in the sloth and having a case report to rely on to kind of think about is very important for us. Um, but I think we tend to go to it and think about it as like one of our differentials when we look at sloths with issues because it's been published. Um, I, I think actual incidence is still pretty, pretty low. So typically what you'll see with Addison's disease, which also goes by the name of the great pretender because it can look like anything, um, is that you'll see a decreased um, blood sodium potassium ratio. That's usually the tip off. Now, sometimes you have atypical Addison's and you don't see that. Um, and that's probably more complicated than we need to go into for this particular talk, but um, it can be challenging to diagnose. However, this case was pretty classic. Um, once they started doing testing, they found low cortisol levels, which is again, what, what happens with Addison's, there's just not enough cortisol being produced. And then when you give the animal ACTH or adrenal corticotropic hormone, um, you're supposed to get an increase in cortisol, but it doesn't have a normal stimulation. It doesn't produce enough cortisol. And then when you see a low test result, that's usually pretty um, characteristic of Addison's. And this sloth had that. Um, and then unfortunately, the sloth passed away because I think it was just it was probably too far gone by the time they were able to diagnose what was happening. Even with treatment, it didn't make it. Um, but on necropsy, when they, they looked at the um, adrenals under histopath, the, they were not normal anymore. And that's because of the Addison's disease. So a very interesting case. And I see a lot of people go to it as part of the differential list because it's probably one of the most cited cases in sloths. Um, but I think the incidence is probably actually relatively slow, like low, but I wanted to put that out there so everybody's aware of it. Okay, moving on to our last section on preventative care. Um, and so for any cap species that we keep in captivity, we always start with a review of husbandry. So um, talking to the primary caretakers about their behavior, um, looking at welfare, which could be a whole nother topic um, of conversation. So looking at welfare assessments uh, of the animal and how that could be done. Um, and then getting regular body weights. And so like we were saying, because their body weight changes so um, drastically with urination defecation, being able to look at that over time and not just a single point in time. Um, for the most part, we recommend, I would recommend a physical exam on an animal at least annually. Um, or at the most every other year. So they're relatively long-lived species. And so it's important to, to get that data when they're, um, like get baseline data when they're young and when they're healthy. For lab work, um, hematology and biochemistry are part of our standard urinalysis and fecal exam as, as well. There are plenty of papers that are providing um, reference intervals, reference ranges, points of reference point, um, for uh, various analytes from the blood. Um, so for your CBC and your chem to, uh, to refer to, to help with interpretation. And then if you do have um, access to a program like ZIMS, um, it allows for uh, sharing of, of data between institutions and kind of um, uh, summarizes the values for that species across institutions to provide some point of reference for you. These are great. I'm leaving this to you. So, you know, we mentioned this, and I know we're kind of probably running out of time a little bit, but um, in the one of the first slides, we talked about training for, um, you know, doing things like this. So this is nice because if you can have the animal and managed care work with you to benefit its own veterinary care, we're super happy to have that done. It's one less effort, to, you know, one less need to do an anesthetic procedure. So this sloth um, was trained to hang on her little, like, apparatus here, and she's just having awake radiographs while she's being fed by her trainer. Um, takes, you know, all of a few minutes and, and it's done. Um, the same sloth here being ultrasounded because she looked pregnant. Um, just, we did this, you know, pretty much weekly to, to see the development of the fetus. Um, and she was great. She was fantastic for us. So just presented, presented those because there are lots of different ways you can train your sloth to do um, things that you, you know, otherwise might have to do under anesthesia. And then looking at venipuncture, we kind of mentioned this before. Um, there's the jugular and the, or the cranial vena cava. That's not a site that I've used personally. Um, the femoral vein I have used, and that's what you have these images on the, the right of the screen. And it's very similar to a primate where you're going um, really like at the base, it follows 
um, kind of parallel with the with the femoral bone with the femur and it's a, a blind stick although sometimes if you palpate you could feel the artery next to it um pulsing which is not necessarily the one that you're going for but not the end of the world if you do uh it just requires um maybe a lot of pressure on the site for a little bit longer than you otherwise would and then i have a uh, this picture of the superficial antecubital or the you know the proximal cephalic vein and so that's looking at the medial aspect of the forearm um and uh you could see the vessel running we just like clipped a site and i'm pointing to it with a uh, with the needle there that makes a good site for blood draw and if you had to place a, an iv catheter might also be a good site for that as well since uh, since you can see it okay and then finally looking at um vaccination so for preventive care, a lot of what you vaccinate with, if you vaccinate, is going to depend on what's endemic in your area. So in North America, rabies is obviously a big issue for us. Um, so most of the sloths that I work with, if not all, have been vaccinated with rabies once a year. We don't know the duration of immunity. We don't know how effective the vaccine is. Um, but if they have any human contact, for example, their ambassador sloths or sloths that, you know, people go in with on a regular basis, we... Uh, at least the institutions I worked with have chosen to go ahead and vaccinate them for rabies. I've never seen a reaction to the vaccine. Um, it might be overkill, um, but that's just an institutional choice to, to give that to those animals. Um, and part of that may be due to regulatory issues within the state in which you live. So probably different for some of you who live in different countries. Um, it's always going to be, you know, just we usually just give the MRAB3 or, or standard, you know, dog to cat, horse, uh, rabies vaccine. Um, and, you know, if you want information on that, I can give you that offline as well. Um, based on the studies that have come out, or this, I guess there's a couple of reports now of canine distemper in sloths here in North America, I've, I give all the sloths that I work with um, the recombinant ferret canary pox vector distemper vaccine. Again, I have not seen any reactions to it, but because there is a potential risk to sloths that have more outdoor exposure, um, and certainly it's prevalent in the area in which I work. Um, so I, I go ahead and give that to them um, annually, but that's that's just a personal preference. It's also based on what's prevalent in the area in which I live and the ant sloth lives. Um, the other two vaccines, uh, the tetanus toxoid, I've never given, and I don't know that there's a ton of need to, but it's certainly been given historically. Um, this is from Zim's data. Um, and then the, 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 the COVID or SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, I think some of us were very enthusiastic and gave it to every mammal when we had it available. Um, again, not commercially available, um, and I believe no longer even experimentally available. Um, and really, since sloth don't seem to be a particular risk for this based on, you know, case numbers, um, probably not necessary to continue doing this at this point. Um, so kind of outlining what's been done and potentially some of the reasons why you might or might not vaccinate. And there may be other vaccines that you might choose to use depending on where the sloths are housed. I had to include this photo because this, I mean, it's just too cute. This is like the type of picture that keeps me up at night that I think about. Um, and so the Sloth Institute was <laughs> kind enough to uh, allow me to use that image. So basically um, to summarize, um, Common issues that are like we're presented with for sloths and managed care, um, rooted in inappropriate husbandry, sometimes renal disease, metastatic mineralization, diarrhea, um, gastric dilatation and dilatation in volvulus, and then dental malocclusions are probably the most common uh, that we know of. Um, but really, we would say that in the end, like a lot more research is needed to improve um, the clinical medicine to really practice evidence-based medicine in these animals. And to leave you off um, some resources, uh, the AZA, the Sloth SSP, has a fantastic advising veterinarian um, in its ranks. And then we have uh, the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the European uh, counterpart. We have this group that we're speaking for, so our uh, IUCN specialist group. And then I think that we um, also use for reference um, the Zoo and Wild Animal um, Medicine textbook and the um, manual for the management, medicine, and rehabilitation of sloths um, that's been published in Spanish um, is really like an excellent resource for all things um, uh, sloth related. And then, of course, the Nutrition Advisory Group. With that, if there are any questions, I think that concludes our whirlwind 
uh, tour of uh, sloth medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Dominique and Dr. Pete. And thank you, of course, everyone for attending this webinar. I am going to do a brief intro to our specialist group. And then I'm going to just ask you guys a couple of questions because Dominique has been gratefully answering them as they come in. But I do want people to who are watching the recording to know what's going on. So I am Kenny Coogan. I'm the education coordinator for the IUCN SSC Anteater Sloth and Armadillo Specialist Group. We have a website, which is anarthrins.org, and we are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you go to YouTube, you can see all of our past monthly webinars there. If you go to our website, you can see lots of information, including species accounts for all of the Xenarthrins, and there is almost 40 species. So tons of information there. Our website is available in English, Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese. If you go to our website or our uh, YouTube channel, you will see that we have four videos on anteater sloths, armadillos, and extinct xenarthrins. And these are also available in Spanish, Portuguese, and in English. And we have accompanying worksheets and coloring sheets and mazes and spot the difference activities for you to utilize at your zoological institutions or your rehab. Um, you're welcome to download them and utilize them. And we want to celebrate Xenarthrin, so please get your pencil out and write down these dates. International Armadillo Day was two days ago. We hope you celebrated. We know that the Denver Zoo, who is here right now, did celebrate. That is August 13, it's the same date every year. This year, International Sloth Day is October 21st. The date changes every year. It is always on a Saturday. And then we have World Anteater Day, and that date is the same every year. So the day of the week changes. Next month, we are going to be having a webinar on the giant anteater. This presentation will be done in Portuguese, but the slideshow will be in English. And if you work at a zoological institution or a rehab center, we would love to populate our Instagram and Facebook page with your animals. You can email me to my personal account, and then I will post them on behalf of the specialist group. And if you feel inspired to save Xenarthrins, if you want to conserve them, you can go to our website and you can click the support button or the donate button. And it's available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And then you could just give out, right? And that will help our conservation and our education initiatives. Or what's a little more popular maybe is if you go to our spring store, which ships internationally, you can get these really cool stickers. You can get a mug. You can get this anteater t-shirt that I am wearing. And then you can wear our cool merch and show it off to your friends and family, all while supporting Xenarthrins. All right. And we, of course, want to thank our partner institutions, FIA, Foundation for International Aid to Animals, and Nurtured by Nature for su supporting our webinars, our educational content, and our conservation content. All right. And with that... I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. And of course, thank you to the nearly 80 people who attended this webinar live. All right, so I'm going to just scroll around. But I did see somebody was commenting that sometimes when their sloths eat, their food gets stuck on the roof of their mouth. And then some people chimed in and were saying that they should soak the, um, soak the monkey biscuits or the... Uh, herbivore biscuits, and then other people were saying that they steam the vegetables, and then other people were saying that they should chop up the vegetables. So, uh, Pete and Dominique, what do, you, what do you say about those poor sloths that can't get that food out of their mouth? Check their teeth. <laughs> yeah. Check their teeth. Um, I mean, I'll start, and then Pete, if you want to add. Um, yeah. Boy, I've seen sloths fed everything, right? With cooked food, soaked biscuits, uh, way too much fruit. This is interesting. I've, I've never worked with a sloth that had stuck 
the food stuck to its mouth, but it sounds like from the answers that that's actually happened in a lot of places. Um, I would definitely say check the teeth um, and maybe the character of what you're feeding, but I don't know, Pete, any thoughts about that? Well, I'm laughing because I actually just like maybe two weeks ago, I had a look at our sloth for the same presentation that food was getting stuck to the roof of the mouth. Um, and that was my first go to is to look at the the teeth um, and try to make sure that there's no points and bring everything into um, proper occlusion. But then you run into an issue where do you make the food softer so it's easier for them to chew and to swallow? Or is that going to make things worse because now that it's soft and gummy and it's going to get stuck to the roof of their mouth, kind of like us trying to eat peanut butter. Um, and so I think that making sure that there are no like subtle lesions in the tongue and no ulcers in the mouth and then making sure that the teeth are appropriate is the is probably your go to. And then after that, like see if they can figure them themselves out make sure the diet is appropriate, you know. All right, we got a message from Andreas and Anna. They said, I have seen secondary pseudo fangs formed on the moliform teeth, um, specifically bilateral M1, a real headache for food consumption. And then uh, Anna added, I have also seen this in very old wild sloths. Do you guys have any comments on those teeth grinding up on each other and making extra fangs? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of similar to the picture that we showed in the slide, the slides. I think that's what's happened. They're having malocclusion issues. I've seen people where the described cases where the sloths just couldn't close their mouths because their teeth weren't, you know, like occluding properly. Um, but what was interesting was, as a note, that they've seen that in the old wild sloths. So I'm not sure exactly what's happening there, but that that's super interesting. Not that I have any answers for you, but I find that very interesting. And that's what science is. <laughs> Gina asks... If antibiotics are needed for a treatment plan, is it beneficial to also prescribe a probiotic to help with the gut flora? Always a big question, right? I think that's always going to ask that. I don't know that there's any definitive proof that giving the probiotic at the same time makes a difference, but Pete, thoughts? I, I would say that it doesn't make a difference is, is my thought. Um, part of it is that you know, first you have to look at the profile of the antibiotic that you're giving, um, and you're trying to stick with antibiotics that are not going to go after the the flora that they're relying on for fermentation, right? And then after that, with probiotics, the question is, um, you know, are we giving the right strains and the right type of bacteria? Is it alive when we're giving it? Is it getting to the site that we need it to get? So is it staying in the stomach and surviving? And then is it colonizing that, you know? And then if it is colonizing that, is it like, are we providing enough of it that it's making a difference? And so I think that what's more important is relying on um, relying on the animal's natural flora. And so making sure that we're not, we're being careful with our antibiotic choices. We're being careful with our route of administration. So I would try to go with injectable or parental antibiotics if I was concerned with that. And then providing the right diet because we're feeding the, we're not just feeding the sloth, we're feeding like its own bacteria, right? So making sure that we're feeding the bacteria that it relies on in its GI tract um, is probably like, you know, that's, that's gonna be more important in my opinion, at least. All right. Somebody, Jackie asks, is there any research that shows that the algae growth on a sloth hair is important um, to their health in any way? And I will say that there's a professor at Ole Miss who wants to study this. Yeah, I, I worked with some researchers from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I think one of the hypotheses they had was that the algae was beneficial. I don't think they conclusively proved that. And part of the reason for that was we did gastric washes on the sloths in Costa Rica to collect samples to see how much algae was in there. And it wasn't a lot. I mean, there was definitely algae in there, um, but I don't think that there was enough to say that that was contributing a lot to their health or their diet or, or you know, for vitamins. Um, so probably there's still more research to be done. Um, but I, my gut feeling at this moment is we don't have a definitive answer for that. And it, it probably isn't. But again, I'll let the researchers do more research over the years to figure that one out. Yeah. There is a paper someplace on this where they talk about like the nutrient content of the algae, but I don't think they were able to conclude if there was, like you just said, like if there was enough to actually make a difference in the diet of the sloth, even though it was present in the algae. Would sloths be especially susceptible to respiratory problems 
regarding air pollution or wildfires. And I'm in Florida and I experienced Canada's wildfires recently. Yeah, um, I'll start. Unless Pete, you wanna go ahead and start on this one? Yeah, please, feel free. <laughs> So I was in the process of answering this one, and I think it's a really important point. I mean, so many more of us have been exposed to this in our animals at zoos, right? So Florida, yes, because of Canada. California, classic. You know, who knows now, Hawaii. Um, and certainly, I think any areas where wildfires are prevalent. You know, as we showed you, these guys have really small thoracic cavities. There's not a lot of redundancy. Having said that, the question is, would they be especially susceptible to it? I don't know that that makes them more susceptible. They just don't have a lot of respiratory redundancy there. Um, but more importantly, I think it's a concern for any zoos that are in areas where this is happening more and more often. I don't think it's just sloths are going to have a problem with that. I think it's anything. Like we see um, the results of air pollution in our birds here, birds, not sloths. Um, well, we'll see um, particles on necropsy that are clearly from uh, material that's in the air from either wildfires um, and or air pollution. I'm you Okay. You showed pictures of the outer GI tract, but what does the normal musco look like in each part of the GI tract? For that, I would probably refer, I know that there are, are really great images in the, the manual, the um, medicine and rehabilitation manual by uh, uh, Duner and Pastor that, uh, that's available online. Um, and there might also be some images in the pathology textbook um, by Tyrio and colleagues. It's hard to describe otherwise, it, like a picture is worth a thousand words. So. Somebody was asking if sloths menstruate in a similar way to the others in Arthrans, the anteaters and the armadillos. And then a lot of people were commenting, is there a blood or health test that you can sex sloths? Um, and it looks like Jody's just answered the part about the sexing. Um, and in the chat, she's actually got a contact. So that's for San Diego, which is great because I've, I've not had that information. So now I'm really glad to have it. Thank you, Jody, for sharing that. Um, so she's listed it in the chat. So for those of you who have access to that now, um, go ahead and copy that. For those of you on the recording, um, the San Diego Zoo will be your contact. They have a, an amazing resource when it comes to all that molecular work. Um, looks like it's blood, 200 microliters, but they can work with hair. So awesome for sharing that resource. Um, and then in terms of the menstruation, I, I've certainly seen it in female sloths, not reliably. In other words, not always, not all the time. Um, sometimes you'll be holding a sloth and you'll have you know a little bit of material on you. Um, but I think Andres maybe said that he saw also in males. So I think Cloacal secretions are probably fairly common in sloths, um, but I have definitely seen it cyclically in at least one female sloth. I have not, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Dominique and Dr. Pete. We have used up all of our time. And thank you for everybody who attended this. And uh, we hope you guys attend our next monthly at uh, UCN's and Arthur and Specialist Group webinar. All right, bye everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.